You probably never heard of Matthew Munschow, and that's as it should be. He's not a person that's worthy of honor or respect. So what's, what's notable about that man? His vindictiveness. Matthew Munschow lived in Milwaukee in obscurity until he made the news by engaging in a spree of vandalism in 2003. We aren't sure what triggered him to begin that at that time to try to seek revenge, but it seems that Matthew Munschow had decided to get even with all those people who had ever wronged him. No one knows how long his list of grievances were or who he intended to get back at because he was apprehended after his third act of vandalism, bringing his tour of revenge to a sudden end. The first house he visited on that tour, he used fluorescent paint to spray the house all over. He sprayed it with vile graffiti, covering it with obscenities, with threats, with taunts, and with crude sexual graphic images. What was his grudge against the 75-year-old homeowner there? Well, it seems that Matthew blamed that man for getting him fired from his job 10 years before. And the job that he got fired from was a minimum wage job working at a grocery store. But for 10 years, he harbored that grievance against this man who was by now retired, and he did that to his house. He went from there, traveling to the address of another man. Again, he spray-painted the man's house, but this time he also gathered all the pot potted plants that he could find around the house and dumped them in the man's hot tub. He then proceeded to slash the tires of vehicles parked near the house. How had this man wronged him? He had intervened in a fight Munschow was having with a girl in a parking lot five years previously. The last act of vandalism that he committed before being apprehended was at the home of a woman. Maybe he had run out of fluorescent paint for this vandalism because this time he attacked by dumping paint stripper all over the cars parked anywhere near her property. What was the offense that he was retaliating against her? Sometime in the past, he believed that she had cut him off in traffic. Obviously, Matthew Munschow never read How to Win Friends and Influence People. He must have skipped that class on uh, Sunday school about forgiveness. And turning the other cheek was not in his wheelhouse. Hopefully, no one here is that petty. But still, most of us can identify with feelings of our lives being wronged. Most of us can recount something that happened to us at some time where we feel like we were slighted or we were injured by someone else. We might even understand the attraction there is in seeking revenge. But revenge is not a fit motive for the people of God. We are not to hold grudges. We're not to seek to get back at those who have acted or spoken against us. And this we find illustrated by King Saul early on in his reign. We're going back to 1 Samuel again this morning, but we're going to do something a little bit different just now. For the first verse of our text, we need to back up a bit before the passage that we had last week about the battle. Uh, to see something recorded just after Saul was announced as king, to revisit something 
that was, that was recorded about that right after he was announced as king. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 27. But certain worthless men said, How can this one deliver us? And they despised him and did not bring him any present, but he kept silent. The remaining two verses of our text are recorded just after Saul had triumphed over Israel's enemies in that battle as we talked about last week. 1 Samuel chapter 11 verses 12 and 13 where we find these words. Then the people said to Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring them in that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day. For today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel. Why don't you see in our text this morning that Saul did not seek revenge. It must have hurt Saul as he began his reign to have some outspoken critics that weren't even going to give him a chance, that already had condemned what kind of king he was going to be. I know from personal experience how hard it is to have people who make critical attacks against me. The ministry is a, a position that opens a person to sometimes unearned praise. But far more often, it opens one up to the attacks of harsh criticism. In the ministry, dozens of people think that you're, they're your boss. And everyone has an opinion about what you should do or say, or how you should do it, or how you should say it. And even those who have little idea of what is required to do the work I do, or the hours of preparation necessary, can be very vocal about what I'm doing wrong. My graduating class at Lincoln Christian College was the largest one in the history of that school. And yet I know only a handful of those I graduated with that are still in the ministry. I'd say 99% of those that I graduated with have dropped out of the ministry since we graduated. Most of them dropped out simply because they found the criticism that came with the job to be too costly. They didn't want to have to deal with people that had mean motives in the things they said about them or were trying to undermine their ministries. I've heard some say that if one's going to be in the ministry, one has to have the hide of a rhino. Well, you know something? I don't. I'm not immune to the barbs of my critics. It hurts. And sometimes I do that not very productive thing of bringing up what's been said about me again and again in my mind. That's something that should be put away. That's something that I should not torture myself with. But I find myself doing that sometimes, worrying about the things that people have said to me or the things they've said about me to others. It hasn't stopped hurting over the years of the ministry. I've just learned through the years of the ministry how to better handle the hurt in a more mature way. But it hurts. It hurts to be criticized. And I'm not going to be covering your house with fluorescent graffiti, but it hurts. It had to sting Saul that these men were so negative towards him. Again, they didn't even give him a chance, but right from the beginning, they were saying that he was not fit for the job, that he was not going to do anything for them. Now, when we look at Saul and we look at the hurt that he took, it's sort of interesting that we find Saul in a position to retaliate. As the king of Israel, he could have marked out his enemies. He could have done something to throw them in prison or to destroy them altogether, and no one could have stopped him from doing that. He had the power of the army behind him. And had he wanted to eradicate his enemies, that was something he could do. But it's beyond that. 
Did you notice in our text this morning that it wasn't Saul calling for the heads of these men? That he had such popular approval after this military victory that the people were calling to Samuel to bring out these men who had criticized Saul so that they could be put to death. He not only had the power to take his vengeance, he had the backing of the people who wanted him to take his vengeance. But he didn't. He argued instead here in our text that it was God, not him, who had won the victory. Further, he said that it was God's intention to bless Israel, not to harm them through this victory. So he implies that it, that it would be wrong of him to divert that purpose to use the victory as an opportunity to destroy his personal enemies. You know, I think this is another sign of what kind of man God had selected to be the first king of Israel. We might see all sorts of faults in Saul at the end of his kingship after, after the pressures of the job and the constant adulation and the power had corrupted him. But at the beginning, when God had selected this man, this man was, had a heart for God. This man was a good man. This man wanted to do what was right. And so even though his enemies were placed in his hands, as it were, here, he would not take vengeance against them. I think about the fact that each of us are hurt from time to time. Each of us have been offended in the way somebody drives aggressively around us. In something they've overheard in the church fellowship. In something that's done at a, at a family gathering. You know, there's, there's thousands of ways that people might have offended us. But each of us should remember, as Saul did, that while we are tempted to act against those who have wronged us, God's person is more concerned about God's will than his own being done in his life. We don't seek to harm others when we would want to because it's God's will that we should not. I want you to see the other thing in this text this morning. We aren't going to spend very much time here. But I want you to think right now about the season that we're involved in. Christmas means a lot of things. And you see all sorts of messages, those which are true and those which are nonsense, that are brought up about this time of year about what Christmas means. But I want to tell you one thing that Christmas reveals to us. Christmas reveals that our God is not vindictive. You know, that's, that's not how people view God. A lot of people see God as ready to judge. A lot of people even think of God as being petty in his nature, in getting back at anybody that's offended him. Revenge, after all, is a right that God has reserved for himself. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, he has told us. He has said, it is my right to seek revenge. It is not your right to seek revenge. God is the one person for whom vengeance is not wrong because he alone can sort out what is a needful response to wrong, to the violator, and what is motivated by base anger? God can separate the sin from the response. Evil must meet justice. There are some things that a righteous judge, there are some things that a holy God cannot allow to stand. God alone has the right to sit in judgment. Only he is untainted by the sin by which we would judge. And so God is the one who we must allow to sort things out. In fact, if God is good, eventually all that which is corrupt must meet a righteous condemnation. 
Furthermore, I want you to think about this this morning. God has been wronged by everyone. We say that sometimes, you know, everyone's picking on me. But the truth is, every sin is a violation of the person of God. God has been wronged by everyone who has chosen to sin, and that's, that's everyone. His holy nature is assaulted by those who do evil. And again, that list of violators includes us. We have sinned. We are worthy of his condemnation. Our God, who flooded this world in his condemnation of human corruption, could seek to annihilate us because of what we've done. Our Lord, who drove out the money changers from the temple with a whip and overturned the tables that they were working at, could be filled with wrath due to the wrong that we have done. And yet, Christmas reveals something very different than a wrath-seeking God, than a God looking for vengeance. Christmas reveals that God isn't looking to inflict on us what we deserve. Jesus entered this world to deliver us, not to destroy us. Saul had reasoned that the deliverance of God in his intervention had ruled out revenge. And so we can reason that God's deliverance in Jesus Christ would make it wrong to have the offender meet his wrath. Jesus came to deliver people from their sins, not to destroy them for their sins. And all those who receive that deliverance will escape the judgment that their sins deserve. This, this is a wonderful message of, Chris, of Christmas that I wouldn't want anybody to miss. That our God is not vengeful. That our God does not seek to destroy us. That Jesus Christ came for the very purpose of rescuing us. And as we have that wonderful message of Christmas before us, that though we deserve his wrath, he came offering his love instead. We would come to our invitation time this morning. This Christmas season, will you receive his love for you? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave him for us. That baby in the manger in Bethlehem, foretold the Savior on the cross who died in our place 